Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Wednesday market update. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital. On today's webcast, we will provide you with a brief market update, and we're going to focus on one of our key strategies, the income strategy. Joining me today is David Burroughs, President and Chief Investment Strategist here at Barometer. And with that, I turn the conversation over to David. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pam. How are you? Great. Thank you for asking. How are you? Well, I'm well. Here we are a year later. I don't have to wear a suit. That's pretty nice. I got a nice company sweater on. And, uh, and I guess we're all settled into the routines that we've, we've formed along the way. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Our, uh, our team has been working hard. Uh, I'd love to know how many minutes we've spent on Zoom over the last year. We have several meetings a day. And uh, we've all become pretty adept. It's interesting. We were having a conversation today about real estate and office space. And I wondered out loud, who on earth is going to want to get in a car and drive downtown and go up an elevator to sit in a boardroom across the table from somebody in a suit to have a meeting when we've, we've gotten so used to using Zoom? So uh, anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, I think the world is ultimately going to be a different place when we're done this process. Um, what I'd like to do today is just sort of run down sort of top to bottom what we are watching and what we're focused on. Uh, we're really uh, pretty happy with the way the portfolios are performing uh, and positioned, but we are watching as always for any sign of, of change uh, in, the, in the portfolios. Um, bottom line is we're always trying to do the same thing. Uh, we use the tools and the process that we have to try and identify the key structural themes in the market, those areas that have a tailwind, those areas that are benefiting from the current backdrop, uh, and where uh, we have opportunities to see a, a upward revaluation uh, of asset prices. And certainly, you know, the liquidity in this market is, is giving us a tailwind there. We always are watching for signs that what is working is changing so that we could reevaluate portfolio structure and make sure that we stay ahead of the curve. We don't want to be, you know, reading about issues in the newspaper. We like to try and identify shifts early and get positioned. And that's been a big contributor to our last number of months, getting positioned early for a big shift in market dynamics. Uh, and then, of course, there will be some times when we have to play defense. Uh, and that's a fact of life. And we spend a lot of time using the tools that we have to kind of manage risk. And that means going to cash sometimes. It means uh, exiting big parts of the market. Very often, uh, sectors or themes become well-loved and over-owned. And, and there is a time when we have to step aside. And, and usually at a time when it's not a very popular decision to do that, uh, we don't seem to be at one of those points right now. So it is quite a tactical approach. We are picking our spots. The portfolios are 20 to 40 positions, pretty, pretty concentrated and focused. Uh, and, and realistically act quite unlike the market itself. Uh, we have been in a structural bull market since the market broke out in 2013 to new highs. Uh, and that means that it's sort of like four steps forward, one step back. There certainly are corrections, but not like the ones we see in a secular bear market like 2001 and two or 2007, eight. Certainly 1974 was a, was a rotten one, down about 50%. Uh, and certainly the ones in the 1930s and early 1940s are very difficult. So uh, we do recognize that, that right now our job is to be focused in, in this asset class. U.S. was the first major market in the world that broke out. And if we take a sort of a quick history of, of the Dow, uh, you had the bear market that took place from 1929 through the early 1950s. The market made no progress. Uh, over that 20 year period. Ultimately, it did break out. And then over the next 49 quarters, the market marched its way higher. And ultimately, over that period, top to bottom, uh, bottom to top, sort of just about 300% return. Uh, and then ultimately, market went into a consolidation phase and went sideways from 1966 to 1982, uh, which was an exceedingly long structural bear market. And we're you know, some, some cyclical rallies along the way, but cyclical declines, it took away the gains. And by the early 1980s, you know, Business Week was publishing uh, articles, including the one on the cover, uh, one, one month uh, uh, is, is Wall Street dead, uh, the death of equities. 
And that was right around the time the market broke out. And then it rallied 1300% over 70 quarters between 1981 and 1999-2000, uh, where again, market rolled over and went into a, went into a, a sleep where money slowly left the U.S. stock market and went to other types of assets. You know, I know in our case, we really rotated towards income securities because we knew that maybe certainty might be a better, a better thing to have. Uh, we had to be quite tactical on the equity side. And then 2013, the market broke out again. And so to put it in perspective, the Dow is up about 150%. Uh, or the largest gain is about 200%. We've been about 39 quarters versus 70 quarters or 210 months in the market of the 80s and 90s or 50 quarters um, during, uh, during uh, uh, the period between 1952 and 1966. So both in uh, amplitude or percentage gains and time, it would still put this bull market, you know, in, in, in good stead for a long road ahead of us. And we know that the U.S. stock market was the first market in the world to break out after a long sleep. Other major markets in the world are just breaking out of their bear markets they've been in, you know, over the last few months. In the S&P, we broke out in 2013 and we worked our way higher. And again, in a bull market, you still have sharp corrections like we did in 2015, like we did in 2018 and like we did in 2020, just like in the 1990s, 1990-91 recession, 1994 uh, correction and so on. So we just still have to manage these. Uh, when we look at the NASDAQ, similar picture, we continue to be in this channel we entered, but the market broke out in 2016. So really only a little over four years ago. And you know we probably have quite a long run in front of us there as well. In both cases, the S&P and the NASDAQ were sort of in the high end of this channel. We, we recognize it has been quite good lately, but you can see that as bull markets go on, often the trajectory actually tips higher than just a linear move. And that's something that we wanna keep an eye on, but that turns out to be a period when you can make a lot of money. In the long view, we think that we've been going through a bottoming in rates and we've been talking about that. Bond investors have had a difficult time since last March. Bond prices have been falling fairly steadily. And in fact, may be picking up some steam and that means bond yields have been going higher. So if you bought a 30 year bond at $179 and today it's at 149, you've lost $30, you've got a little coupon, uh, but not very profitable. And that means that bond investors slowly are picking up their chips and going to another game. But the bond market's 10 times the size of the stock market. It is a, just a small trickle leaving the bond market at this point. And that can go on for a very long time. In Canada, as yields have started to move higher, it's important to note that what works changes. So on the bottom of this chart, since uh, 2019, as we've been going through this process, you've seen the banks start to outperform the REITs and the utilities. So banks do better in a reflationary environment. REITs and utilities act a lot like bonds. It's a high dividend paying security without a lot of growth attached or economic sensitivity. And so very clearly these are diverging. And our view is we wanna be in reflationary assets and that certainly is where we're focused. So um, as yields have been moving up, I just want to point out, it's really just scratching the surface because bond yields on 30 year bonds and 10 year bonds have been falling since 1981. And if this is a generational shift marked by the exclamation point of, of the COVID virus, this could go on for a long time. And that's what drives a slow secular shift from one asset class to another. And equities are a beneficiary of that. Now, this is the bank ETF. And while it's been good over the last few months, we are still not close to the 2007 peak in the banks. Now, certainly the best banks, Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan are well through their highs, as it will be the best securities behave best at the beginning and others come along for the ride as time goes by. 
but I don't want it for a minute for us to get the thought in our heads that because we've had a few months where banks have outperformed, that it's over. It hasn't even begun. And the reason that banks do well during rising rates is that the spread that they get between what they pay in deposits and what they can lend out at expands and they're able to raise their dividends. And that gives us an opportunity to make money beyond what you would get in fixed income. And that's fixed income is not so attractive in rising rates. When we look at corporate bonds, not so popular, not so, not so productive either. This is a chart that looks at the excess return that a corporate bond investor gets for each unit of duration or time they sign up for. So the further out you go on the, on the curve for interest rates and time, you're picking up very little excess return over what you would get in a government bond. In fact, if we compare that to, if we compare that to um, uh, over time, you can see back in 1990, you were getting 2% for each measure of duration. We're getting 22 basis points today. So if rates move higher, it becomes a very difficult time for a bond investor. Okay, so uh, let's talk about commodities. We talked about the fact that we think that commodities are going through a bottoming process. And certainly there has been evidence of that. A few weeks ago, we pointed out the fact that we were breaking a 10 year downtrend in the broad based commodities indices. As we sit today, that is continuing. These are monthly bars, but again, it's the very beginning and can go on for a long time with interruptions. And certainly some, some, some commodities better than others. Agricultural commodities have gone sideways over the last 10 years, but actually breaking out to new highs recently. That's really productive. Gold and silver, much better than the average commodity. Uh, but copper certainly making a nice turn uh, and other commodities along with it. So what is driving all this? We've talked about the stimulus in the system. We've talked about the printing that's been taking place to try and create confidence. We know that currency and circulation has been growing rapidly. And I used this chart at the end of last year to show that 21% of all the US dollars in existence were printed in 2020. So the old saying, don't fight the Fed could never be more uh, important than it is right now. We know that there's all kinds of things to be worried about, but when I go through the flood of liquidity that has been put into the system, governments and central banks are making it very clear that they wanna make sure that we come to the other side of this virus in a, in a position where the economy can flourish. So that's 21% of all dollars printed in 2020. This is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. So the size of the balance sheet or the number of assets that the Fed has purchased over time has been growing. But in the past year, their balance sheet has gone from $4 trillion in assets to $8 trillion in assets, or it's doubled. That's $4 trillion they've pushed into the system in the form of liquidity. Another source, excess savings. As people have not been spending money, they've been putting it in the bank. So there was roughly 1.6 trillion in savings above the long-term average got put away by private investors last year. And it looks as though there will be roughly another trillion dollars in 2021. So that's another source of liquidity that ultimately will be here when we get to the other side of the pandemic. Now let's talk about stimulus. It's hard to remember all of the things that have been done in the past year, but if you add up the fiscal stimulus just in the US in the past year, $3.3 trillion was committed. Now of that roughly 1 trillion is still to be spent, has not found its way out. And now the Biden administration is, is, is proposing another $1.9 trillion or roughly 18% or almost 20% of GDP. So when you put together the savings, when you put together the printing, when you put together the Fed asset purchases, when you put together the fiscal stimulus, you can see that the numbers are a mountain of liquidity. So why is the Fed not concerned about what might happen with all this liquidity? What they're concerned about and have made clear 
is they want to see employment get from where it is now back to where it was. And we know when we went through the financial crisis to get back, it took 76 months. So they want to do everything that they can do to get employment back to where we were as quickly as possible. And they're prepared to see some inflation and they've made that clear. They're prepared to see asset price inflation. They've made that clear. They're not concerned. This is what concerns them. And so in the short run, it's hard to see what could cause them to change their policy and liquidity drives asset prices. So that's not lost on investors. US dollars have been taken and, and converted to other types of assets. And that's continued all the way through the year. The US dollar has been weakening versus the basket of world currencies. There've been several short-term bounces along the way. We talked last week about the fact that we were seeing a very short-term bounce. Oh, we've lost our slides. Let's see where they've gone. Here we go. Uh, so we saw the US dollar rally from the beginning of the year a little bit toward the downward sloping moving averages in the last four days starting to give that back. So I think this is something that is likely to continue for some time. And that means that assets that are reflationary assets tend to be the beneficiary that the assets that people are buying are things that they think will flourish if the economy strengthens and if liquidity continues to be there. So we talked about emerging markets. This is the emerging markets ETF that's making its first new high since 2009. And these are monthly bars. You can see we're making new relative highs versus the US stock market. This is the Chinese stock market again. We started making new highs a little while ago, and that continues, but it's still very early stages. Developed markets, Taiwan, after 20 years of not making progress, finally broke out about eight months ago and slowly marching its way higher. The Japanese market, after not making progress since 1991, has been slowly marching its way higher. These are early stage new bull markets, so global equity is a beneficiary of the current environment. Okay, when we, get to, when we get to the US market, there's been very clear leadership. Technology has been clear leadership. That's cloud-based computing, uh, uh, consumer discretionary stocks, certainly online retail, uh, home builders, um, uh, social media in the communication sector continue to make new highs. Certain structural themes continue within consumer. The marijuana stocks, certainly stronger, stronger, sharply higher again today. Uh, a relatively new theme in the U.S., robotics in, in uh, industrials, within energy, certainly energy itself has made a turn, and solar has been leading along the way. And when we talk about income investors, the big theme has been dividend growth. Now, during falling interest rates, bonds were very productive. During falling interest rates, things that act like bonds were very productive utilities, phone companies, real estate investment trusts, consumer staples. These are the sectors that have been chronically underperforming for the last six months. These are sectors where we have had quite small weights. We are focused on things that are more likely to increase their dividend more rapidly in a stronger economy. So more cyclical assets, things that are more tied to the economy. So we're talking about industrials, financials, consumer discretionary sectors, in certain areas of technology. Other assets that benefit from weak dollar, certainly gold is one of them. And this has been one of the strongest uh, commodities. It has been consolidating over the last few months. My guess is over the next few weeks, we will see it come out of that consolidation having made it first new high since 2012. And we're likely to have a run similar to what happened the last time this happened in 2003. Bitcoin is certainly another one of the assets that is benefiting. Now we've talked about this a little bit. We don't have a huge exposure, but we have had exposure since last summer. Uh, we were there for the run up uh, all the way through the fall. We consolidated through into February. And last week we said, it looks like they're getting ready to go again. And certainly they have. And in fact, if we were to look at it today, <clears throat> You know, closed uh, last I saw about $45,000 per Bitcoin. Certainly, this was a topic of conversation on last week's call, um, but it is one of the assets that would likely to benefit during reflation. So it's a long term asset, I think, that could go a long way. The last time 
it broke out, it had a very significant move. This was about an 11,000% move. And we have just recently broken out again and the market is marked its way higher. Certainly can correct at any time, but this is one piece of the puzzle, the reflationary puzzle. And actually Bitcoin is outperforming gold, which it would be, would be the other asset. So just going back to our process, we try to follow a set of rules every single day. Our top-down process is we take all of the potential investments we could make at any given time. We run our fundamental tests. We look for a combination of about 20 business factors in the income statement, the balance sheet, that point to accelerating growth so that we find in the income side, companies with an improving ability to pay us and where the market may be willing to pay a higher price as they continue to perform and surprise the street. And on the equity side, we're looking for a combination of factors that point to good getting better. We're never interested in broken getting fixed. Companies are doing well to begin with, but we're seeing acceleration in their, in their business metrics, financial metrics, and prices that would support that view. We want strong fundamentals and strong technicals. We run that process against a universe of about 60,000 securities daily to drill down to a list of companies that meet those tests. And then we go through a due diligence process to understand why the numbers are getting better and how long it could go on for. And what could it be that might derail the situation? What it means is that we wind up turning over a lot of rocks. And a lot of the companies we wind up holding in the portfolios are not just the top 10 or 20 companies in the market. Arguably, we went through a period over the last two years where the top five stocks wound up making up 25% of the S&P 500. And while they were outperforming, it was very difficult to do well relative to the index. Since last fall, they have been underperforming. Small and mid-sized companies are outperforming and there's all kinds of interesting new companies coming up from underneath the, uh, the, 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 uh, the surface that are, are making up you know, really solid uh, holdings in the portfolio. Um, on the top-down work, we're looking for those themes and sectors that are seeing net inflows of capital, and we've been talking through that. We're looking for expanding breadth sectors and themes where over time, more and more companies are participating in the rally. So we can have an opinion as to what should happen. Our job is to measure what is happening. And when we see deterioration in breadth, be prepared to go to the sidelines, be prepared to raise some cash, be prepared to step aside. So let's look at what our work is showing us now. The long-term breadth models that we use to show whether more and more securities are participating in the rally, that's healthy. There's no bear market in history that took place while breadth was expanding. We're seeing expanding breadth in Canada and in the US. We had a little correction over the last two weeks in breadth globally, although it looks as though with today's results that model will also turn back to positive. Our short-term indicators, the percent of stocks trading above their short-term or 50-day moving average has been expanding in Canada, the US, and globally. The percentage of stocks with positive price momentum, which means upward trajectory, is expanding. The percentage of stocks making new highs versus new lows is expanding. And the percent of stocks trading above their 150-day moving average or long-term moving average, it's a measure of long-term trend, is expanding, in fact, up over 90%. So I've had people say, when indicators get that high, does that mean we have to have a correction? So we put this up a little while ago. Since the beginning of this secular bull market in 2013, this is the measurement of stocks above their 200-day moving average. And we know that before rallies run out of gas, it tends to be you have a deterioration for a period of months where the percent of stocks trading above their long-term moving average is deteriorating. As we sit today, we're above 90% and not showing any sign of budging. So nothing to see here. This can go on for a long time. It means lots of stocks are doing well. It's a healthy market. It can be uncomfortable when we see things all going up but it's healthy. When we look at um, the number of days where greater than 75% of the stocks in the market were trading above their 200 day moving average, we know it can get up there and stay there for an extended period. 
So each of these rallies were where percent of stocks above their 200 day stayed up there for an extended period. So this is 200 days. This is 150 days. This is 120 days. So you can see during extended rallies, this can go on for quite a while. So far, we have had the percent of stocks above their 150 day above 75% for 60 days. So that could double or triple. So that means that we could have a long number of months where we get very productive markets. So I know it feels uncomfortable and I know we hear lots of talk about bubbles, but this is what happens in a real bull market. Now here's something interesting. Very often when people do searches on the internet for these terms, buy stocks now, how to buy stocks online, stock market, time to buy stocks, when to buy stocks, tends to happen during terrible bear markets, 2008, for example, 2018, sorry, 2000, yeah, 2018, 2020, during the pandemic panic. Unusual in the last number of years is that during this rally, we're now seeing a broader and broader list of people interested in the stock market. That's not an unhealthy thing. That happened through the 1980s and the 1990s. And by the late 1990s, lots of people were participating in the stock market. So the fact that this is happening is not a bad thing. It is likely to go on for a period of time and it expands the number of people who are interested in stocks. So the net of it is, uh, since November, we've been in a very steady rise. We've been in this channel. We are at the top end of this channel. Could it consolidate a little bit? Absolutely, it could. But nothing to be concerned about at this point. The NASDAQ is very similar. Clearly, in this channel, it's been marking its way higher. Certainly, we could pull back 2 to 3 to 4% at any given time. But all of our short-term and long-term indicators are positive. We're positioned in leading sectors, and things continue to work well. Now let's talk about earnings just quickly. We're going through the earnings period. Earnings revisions are increasing significantly, meaning analysts are taking up their numbers. They've been too conservative. The sectors that are getting the greatest earnings revisions are energy, financials, materials, and information technology, industrials, and consumer discretionary. These are where our money is. As a result, we're seeing really great earnings reports. On average in the S&P, 83% of companies are beating the estimate. That's a great number. Analysts have been very cautious. We know in the S&P so far, we've had 333 companies report. The average company is beating their, the revenue estimate by three and a half percent, and they're beating the earnings estimate by 17%. Those are great numbers. I'm very proud of the fact that our analysts have been able to identify some great businesses to be invested in. Our average company is beating the sales number by just about 5% and beating the earnings by 23% versus 17 and three. So that's part of the reason why our positions are performing well. One, they're in sectors that are under-owned. Second, they're beating the estimates by quite a wide margin. Sector weights aren't changing dramatically. They're roughly the same as they've been over the last few weeks. Uh, and the portfolios can really are having a good go. The year-to-date numbers, equity strategies up 18 in the first really month of the year. Uh, global strategies up just about 24%. Uh, the long short pools up 17%. Uh, we have do not have uh, sort of overexposure. Uh, we're being very cautious. We're conscious of the fact that the market can pull back at any point in time. Uh, so we actually have quite a lot of flexibility in the portfolios. <clears throat> Um, uh, and we're monitoring every day for change. So let's talk about bubble. We have lots of talk about bubble. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a measurement that Goldman Sachs does. They have an algorithm to look for signs of irrational exuberance as measured by explosive price behavior. And while what we're seeing recently does feel different than what we've been through over the last few years, and it is, it is nowhere near what we were seeing in the late 1990s. In fact, you know, it's, it's, it's still relatively muted. When we look at flows, this is the flows out of equities over the last few years. The fact that we're seeing a bit of flows into equities recently is not a bad thing. 
but it is certainly not something that's overcooked. When it starts, it will go on for a long time. My guess is we will have cash coming from, from uh, uh, money market funds. We'll have cash coming from savings accounts. We'll have cash coming from bond holdings that are leaving bonds to a more productive asset. But this is something that can go on for a long time. We have seen years of money flowing into bonds and out of stocks. The fact that we're seeing a turn in money going into global equities for the first time in years is a really positive thing. Last thing, comparing earnings yield versus, um, versus the yield on a 10-year bond. Uh, at the peak of the dot-com um, bubble, market cap as a percent uh, um, of, uh, sorry, uh, earnings yield versus treasury yield was a very different picture than where we are today. So, so um, we're a long way from bubble territory. Now we'll watch every day for signs of weakness. We're very willing to go to the sidelines if, if it's required. If our indicators start to turn negative, if our stocks start to hit our stop losses, if our sector work starts to turn negative, we will act. We've done that in the past, but at this point, really, it doesn't appear to be an issue. Um, as we go through February, we know often in February, you get short-term pullbacks. Uh, we're really not seeing any sign of it. We follow our process sort of to the letter. So with that, Pam, I'm happy to take any questions that there might be out there, uh, but, uh, as, as, as we move along, we'll just continue to assess and continue to iterate. Yeah, Dave, thanks so much. This has been a great overview and certainly it's uh, nice to feel the energy and the pulse uh, in the market, even though we're all kind of spread away, it's fantastic. And uh, our investors certainly seem to be quite happy with the return, so good job. <laughs> um, here's a question for Can. It's a Canadian-based or Canadian-centric question. Um, your view on the future of Canadian suppliers of primary building materials like timber, lumber, plywood, etc. What are your thoughts on that? Well, look, um, you know, as 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 we talked about, um, I really think that. Uh, Basic materials are an interesting place to be. So, you know, if we take if we take uh, the a broad based commodities index, certainly moving higher. Uh, this is an equally weighted commodities index. This is the um, the Rogers Commodity Index, which takes all commodities globally and gives them an equal weight. <clears throat> if we look at different groups, certainly agriculture uh, is is one that has been performing particularly well. And this would be companies like the fertilizer companies and the and the um, equipment companies that sell into agriculture. If you want to talk about forest products, you know you don't have to look very far to find uh, stocks that are doing well. This is Interfor. Uh, here's Canfor. Uh, both of them very, very strong, uh, among the strongest in the market, and certainly an area that we're interested in. Uh, you can look at the ETF uh, Wood, <laughs> aptly named. Uh, and this is one that fits. Uh, in the copper, the copper uh, producers performing really well. And certainly we have lots of uh, companies here. Uh, you know, First Quantum would be a great example. Uh, it's been marching its way higher, had a little correction in January and then tipped higher. Um, if you look globally, you know, we have, we have Freeport McMoran as a holding in our portfolios. Uh, HUD Bay Mining uh, also fits. So um, if we take a step away from that and look at uh, the, the um, uh, uranium companies, they recently have started to make a move. And this looks like, this is Cameco, looks like a very significant move to start with. But if I take the lens back uh, and, uh, and frame up the picture, you know, Cameco was, uh, was a $50 stock at $16 today. It's just only just recently made a turn. So a lot of these commodities are in the early stages of a bull market and they can certainly correct. Uh, Canada has lots of exposure in this area, which makes the Canadian market interesting. And it's probably um, a reason to be a little bit more positive on the Canadian dollar. And we are, we are hedging all of our holdings back to, to, to Canadian dollars in our pools. Um, but again, this is sort of the beginning. I think that it, uh, the, the Canadian dollar in general could, could firm up just like the Australian dollar is, which is another sort of commodity related currency uh, versus the world basket. 
Thanks so much, Dave. Could you just briefly walk through our viewers um, how Barometer looks at government, corporate, and personal debt, debt when um, thinking about investment ideas? Well, okay. Let's put this in a really simple way. Um, there's a lot of debt. There's a ton of government debt. There's lots of corporate debt. We don't own a lot of debt. Um, I think you don't get compensated for the risk that you take buying a treasury bond to yield you 1.18% for the next 10 years. Um, so you're going to get paid back, but what's the currency going to be worth? Um, when we talked earlier in the presentation about corporate debt, the amount of excess return you get paid for the risk that you take on. For each year of duration, you're getting an extra 22 basis points or 0.2 of 1%. So that's not very much. So I think realistically that uh, we would prefer to own equity. You know, as of two weeks ago, and I don't know what the number is today, 70% of the companies in the S&P 500 had a higher dividend yield than the yield in the treasury bond. I'd rather have own, own the corporations and, and certainly part of our decision-making process is to look at the balance sheet. Are we comfortable with the amount of debt that they have? Uh, I'm not interested in buying things that are broken, hoping they're going to get fixed. We are always looking for good getting better. So we want only own businesses where they have an improving ability to pay us and their other creditors. Uh, so we're less likely to own something that's highly levered. Um, you know, debt is an issue. It means it's going to be hard for long-term rates to go up quickly. And that would tend to be the case when you see a turn in the early 1950s and 60s. It took 15 years for rates to go from 1.5 to 6.6 um, because there was a lot of debt after the Second World War. So that's why the Fed is trying to create some asset inflation to enable offsetting liabilities with increasing value in assets. And, and that clearly is their strategy. Thanks so much, David. Well, that concludes our questions for today. And as always, it's a pleasure to see you. Thanks so much for taking the time. If there was something that we weren't able to get to you to answer this afternoon, please don't hesitate to email us. My email is phastings at barometercapital.ca or you can give us a call. We're always happy to address our que your questions and of course, appreciate the support. So thanks so much, Dave, I'll leave you with the final word. Thanks, Pam. I guess the thing that I would leave everybody with is I know what we're doing with the investments. We've worked hard over the last 18 months to build portfolios that are, are engineered to perform well during a reflationary period. But really, it behooves everybody to take a look at their things they're invested in, the holdings that they have, and assess, are they helped by rising rates or are they hurt by rising rates? And, and you know, the, the problem is when we go through these big watershed shifts in markets, and I think this is a generational shift, people often take a really long time to recognize that they should be doing something different. And so in this case, um, uh, I think it really is time to make sure that the assets that you hold are set up for a reflationary environment, not a disinflationary environment. So if anybody wants to have a conversation about that, certainly don't hesitate to call us or email us. We'll set something up. Uh, the counselor is certainly happy to talk at any point in time. I think this is the very early stages of something that's going to go on for a long time. And uh, so it's not a race and there will be little pullbacks but I think that this is a shift that can go on for, for years and years. So thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll see you again next week. Thanks everyone. And happy Valentine's day on Sunday. Thanks everyone. Thanks Pam. <laughs>